Welcome everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Really appreciate it. Um, this is gonna be a special creative session this afternoon. Um, I'm Joel Cable. I'm the sector manager for art and design and creative media for Pearson. And Pearson are proud sponsors of the Harlow Arts Trust Sculpture Town Artisan Residence Program or the STAIR program. And that offers uh, a one-year residency with Harlow Arts Trust to an outstanding graduate of the Royal College of Arts. So as part of Pearson's sponsorship of the program, we've arranged for this live event, which will also be available as a recording following the event to allow Pearson teachers, tutors, and learners to engage with the current artisan residents, Roman Cordature. Roman will not only be delivering this remote session, but later this year, she'll also be visiting Pearson centers in and around Harlow to provide learners with live workshops, dialogue, and inspiration. Just to let you know that throughout this session, we've kept your video and audio restricted um, so that your identity is, um, is going to be anonymized so that we can use the recording after the event. So I want to thank the Artistic Director of Harlow Arts Trust, Kate Harding, for organizing this session. And a very special thank you to Roman for delivering it and sharing your practice and insight. I hope you'll enjoy it. And I'm now going to hand over to Kate Harding. Thanks, Joel. Um, so um, yes, yeah, so my name is Kate. I'm the Artistic Director of Harlow Sculpture Town. I'm just going to talk for a moment about um, what about what that is. Um, so Harlow is a new town in the west of Essex. Um, it has an exceptional collection of over 100 public artworks, um, including masterpieces by some of the greatest sculptors of the 20th century. Um, and that includes uh, Barbara Hepworth, Henry Moore, uh, Rodin, um, and, and others. So um, you can see one of those sculptures in the background, that's Barbara Hepworth. Um, so the collection was started in 1953 with the building of the new town itself. Um, and um, as I said, it, it's, there's over a hundred um, at the moment and the collection is still growing. Um, and one of the ways um, that we work to ensure that the collection kind of grows and, and adapts to the town itself um, is through our Sculpture Town Artist in Residence program. Um, and so, um, as I guess Joel um, explained, it's a, it's a year long residency um, and um, with generous sponsorship from Pearson, we're able to run um, uh, creative workshops in education settings. Um, so um, I think I will uh, hand over to um, Roman now, um, whose exhibition, All Being Well, um, will be held uh, in Harlow in November this year. Um, so Roman, over to you. Thank you, Kate. Uh, and thank you, Joel, for um, presenting the, the workshop earlier. So yeah, as they both said, I'm Romain Cordachet, uh, and I'm, I graduated last year from the Royal College of Art. And before starting the um, DIY mold making and plaster casting workshop, I thought it would be great to give you an insight on how I started doing um, these, uh, making these molds and um, growing my practice as a sculptor from scratch somehow. So um, I'll share the screen so you've got a bit of imagery and you can picture a bit more and just... Okay, so... Um, uh, okay. So my background is in textiles. So um, I started being interested in textiles, materials and surfaces from an early age. And I thought, well, the most... Um, the most responsible thing would be to study design. And I went and studied a textile design at uh, Jupiré, which is a school of fashion textile design in Paris. But um, after two years of playing around with textiles, I realized that I was more into hard materials. So I focused on ceramics and on, um, and on uh, concrete and plaster. And after three years, I realized that I was more interested in the way we experience materials, the way we experience a space and the way we experience exhibitions. So I went and studied for a year in information experience design at the Royal College of Art. And that's when I realized that I wasn't so much into design, but I was more interested in making sculptures, paintings, drawings, and other types of art. So I transferred in my second year in sculpture. 
uh, and that's what I'm going to show you now is more how I developed that uh, plaster casting technique from my BA and I carried it on in my master's and how I'm still using it now. So um, these are the few experiments I did in ceramics that was just to illustrate. So I started making my molds um, not from silicon and not using pre-made sculptures in clay or any other type of material. I was just using packaging that I was finding um, around my house. So I was really into polystyrene mostly because I really liked the patterns and textures you could get from um, casting in it, in it. So um, I started with that and also these foam boards. So I would pin everything together. I would tape things together. And then I'd used plaster filler, which is a really uh, fast drying type of plaster that you can use to um, fill holes uh, in walls. So that was what I had at home. I, I just didn't go for the sculpt, you know, sculpting one because I had one at hand in, in my home and it was easier. And it turns out also to be more practical in terms of drying times. So um, I developed, like you can see on the left, uh, so the screen, I, I developed a few blocks of concrete and plaster. Um, that was my research for my degree show in uh, third year of textiles. So that's how I left it um, when I left um, the textile design. And then I did a year in information experience design. That was kind of a break. And then I came back to this technique that I had developed uh, in BA when I transferred in sculpture in last year. So November last, no, uh, November, 2029, uh, 2019, sorry. So yeah, that I came back to the technique and for having, having, having left it for a while on the side, I realized how it was actually a more interesting technique than I thought it was. So I, I wouldn't make molds and I would obviously cast in the molds, but I would left, I would leave some parts out of the mold, as you can see on the picture number two, you can see it's kind of um, free form. It's because it hasn't been cast on that part. So the, the flat parts are cast and the, so the flatter parts are cast, but the parts that you can see that are a bit more blobbish, they're kind of free forms and they, they arise from the fact that I'm using the, the plaster as more of a painting material than a sculpting or casting material. So I developed this a bit more um, last year. I mixed it with pigments. I played around a bit. And while I was playing with this material, I also was using the materials I was using to cast polystyrene mostly, but also other packagings to make sculptures. So I was seeing polystyrene and other materials that you would discard usually as both my material and my mold making uh, components. So I would really embrace the material and I would I would give it as much credit and importance as it should be. It shouldn't be discarded and it should be the sculpture. And so um, this uh, the lost dimension is kind of the the hybrid between um, Schwell and Zauber that you just saw and this other sculpture. I brought together these two inspirations and I made uh, this bigger sculpture that has half of it that was made uh, from polystyrene I found. So I didn't shape any of these polystyrene arches. It was all found like this and I played around a bit, assembled them until I found exactly what I wanted to reach um, architecturally. And, and then using polystyrene that I also had collected at the same time, I, I cast these bigger parts that are, you're going to see here close-ups. So I cast these bigger parts using also polystyrene um, and also implementing other materials such as marble, foam, uh, still pigments and paint um, as part of it. So yeah, um, that is kind of the merge. The mer um, yeah, I merged both uh, techniques and that was the biggest sculpture I hadn't ever done before because um, before I was doing smaller works. Um, and so I think I really am interested in materiality and the importance of materials, both that are more precious and luxurious, but also materials that would just lay in the street. And I see beauty in any kind of materiality with no judgment. And I even push this further um, through 
experimentation in uh, the digital world. So I will play now a tiny bit, a tiny extra of a film I made that is inspired by these collected materials from reality that I then implement into digital software to see how this translation impact um, on the materiality of these. I, I won't play much because we need time for the workshop. But it's just to give an idea of how I translate things from a physical space to a digital space. And it, sometimes also what happens in the digital space will then come back in my physical works and my, yeah, my sculptures and installation. Um, I'll cut it here because we need time. I invite you to, to check this video on online. It's um, It should be on RCA 2020 website. So that was the degree show platform. Uh, and it's a six minutes video, so I will chop it now. And um, I hope it wasn't too long or too boring. And now we're gonna jump into the workshop part of the session, which should be very fun and hopefully playful and also six. Um, We'll, we'll have good results. <laughs> I'll stop sharing now. Um, yes, okay. Right, so um, I will make, maybe everyone needs a, a couple minutes to set up. I'm gonna have myself put this back so we have space to see. Um, okay, could you tell me if you can see everything from your angle? And maybe then in a minute or two, we can kick off. I don't want anyone to be rushing around. I, I can start whenever. That looks good to me, Vernon. Yeah? Yeah. So I'm going to get things around me. So the first part of the workshop, we're going to start by making the mold. So I invite you to get your packagings and other collected bits. So um, I've got these with me. So you're gonna need these. You're gonna need a, a knife, a cutting knife or scissors or both. And you're gonna need your tape. And yeah, that should be it for that first part of the workshop, which is um, is gonna be the, the most tricky, the, yeah, the trickiest part of the workshop because you will have to come up with the shape you wanna, you wanna achieve. So that will be the trickiest part. And the second part is the funniest because you, you get your hands dirty and you you play around with colors and different textures you can you can achieve. So hopefully uh, everyone's ready now to proceed. I wanted to completely remove the mold of the thing that I made last week, which I don't know if I'm really proud of, but it's a good example of what you can uh, achieve from very basic shapes and not so much time spent on it. And I didn't have time to completely remove this. So I'll show you at the end of the session how it looks when it's fully removed. And also don't think you can see many colors on that. It's very dull, but the colors are way brighter and you can reach obviously different colors using your own paint and pigments or uh, spices that you brought today with you. So we're gonna start with bringing all our um, plastic containers with us and before you start cutting anything, you need to consider the fact that um, once you cut something, um, sometimes it's hard to stick it back together and it might not bring you, it might not be a good result. So before cutting anything, um, I, can, I recommend everyone to just see which shapes could work with each other. So for instance, um, before going full in and cutting a huge hole here, I would recommend and that you trace, for instance, if you wanted to just do this and this and you're done, that you trace exactly the right shape before you start cutting. And um, obviously you need to also consider that the more, um, the more elements you're gonna add to your shape, the harder it's gonna get to, to glue together and also maybe to remove the mold. So you can, I would advise that you start with something simple for the first uh, mold you're making and then you could, 
go on from that from there and make a, a harder shape um for today's session i don't think i will use that one like i did last time but i will use these and this will be my main um, mold part so i would um yeah i'd say that you should you should take your biggest container and consider it your base and to that base we're going to add up different uh, elements to it and we're going to take it and the great thing with plaster filler is that it's not running at all so it won't leak easily you even if you have a tiny hole or if not if it's not perfectly um st stuck together it will still work and you'll still get a good result that you can also sand afterwards if you don't like the final result if you had a leak but you shouldn't have a leak um so it might i could also have gone for a bigger mold i could have and so if i had all these elements then this would be my base mold so always go for the biggest part you've got and from that biggest part you're going to add on things um so i'm going to now jump into the thing and um i might just stop talking for a while but um i'll give advice as i cut through and uh, yeah build the thing um for now um you can't ask questions but i'm going to leave us a yeah, 10 minutes and in 10 minutes or 12 minutes, Kate will allow you to ask questions. So if you're struggling with something or uh, if you didn't understand something I said, because that that could, that is likely to happen, then just, yeah, don't, do not hesitate to ask Kate. Um, okay, so. I'm going to try and talk while I do the thing, but sometimes I get a bit, um, I might say, uh, Things that don't make sense if I don't focus on this. Anyways. Yeah, you can you can just play around. Um, I don't know yet what I want, if I want to have these on top or on the side. So do not hesitate to play a bit, but bear in mind that the more complex uh, your shape is, like if I added things on the side, then I'll have to cut through the mold and it might be hard to remove like I did uh, the mistake a bit here. Um, so um, if you if you only build up from one side, like you could just jump and just go one direction, it will be easier to remove than if you have one add-on here and one here and, and a third. Uh, yeah, so I hope it makes sense. And I will now let you work on your thing. Um, it's a lot of playing around at first. Um, don't get frustrated if it looks a bit weird um, at the beginning, because um, it will work anyways. And it's also nice. Um, I'll show you afterwards what you can add to the mold so you get some spillage. Like, okay, so you. If you don't want everything to be straight lines and very contained like in here, uh, you could open apart so you could then pour layers and get something a bit more organic and a bit less control as well. So I'll show you that um, when we're done with the, the mold part. So I decided I wanted this part here. So I've, I've separated that part already and I'm considering maybe having a smaller a smaller circle shape that go somewhere near here um I don't know if that is of interest but I'm really interested in castle um um, um yeah ca castle shapes and manor shapes so I want to I want to look into smaller more minimalistic versions of 
what would tower castles be like? So I'm going through that kind of thing, but I, I think it will be very abstract. Um, so I'm, I'm telling you what I'm doing, but you could be inspired by something else or by no particular shape at all. And you just want to play around with the technique first. It's really completely up to you. So I'm, I'm cutting that part that I'm going to have here. So once you're done with cutting all these and you roughly know where you're going to position them, um, you're going to grab a pen or um, I think I had said to bring a pen with you, it's easier. So you're going to mark where you want them to be. So you're going to come and trace where you're going to have them, have them sit on your main, on your base uh, shape. So you're going to trace, but because you don't want this hole to be too big to fit this one in. So I, I don't know if you will see, but I've traced a square that fits here. Uh, obviously the square is on the other side of this part and you you don't want to cut on the other side. You, you want to cut slightly smaller, even if you need to then make it a bit bigger so it perfectly sits, but you, um, because if you open too much, then you won't be able to, to, to fill in completely with the tape. So I trace my first shape. I'm going to take my knife, be careful, because I just cut myself earlier today. So really be careful and never towards you. Really try and contain your, just your movements when you do that. Um, I usually just do a small cut and then I use scissors because I don't really trust these knives so much. Yeah. Um, um, so I'm roughly removing the in a very tiny part, which is way smaller than the first shape I've traced. But now that I have this kind of this space, I'm going to be able to be more precise and come um, and cut alongside the line I traced, but it, on the inside. And as I said, I would recommend leaving maybe two millimeters uh, along that line and then go again if you need to make it bigger to sit to have this one inside. I hope this, the noise is not too uh, disturbing on, on camera. Okay. Once you kind of cut the size you think you need, um, you can try and fit. So uh, the way I do it, especially because this one has a tiny um, lip, I'm going to try and Correctly shape into the bigger one. So I'm pressing it. Um, in. I see that it's too small on one side, so I'm going to come and make it a bit bigger. It's, it's it doesn't need to be perfect. We'll we'll take it, so it it should be fine. But the the, the more adjusted you you get it the better for you, less work. You should end up with a nicer mold. So it seems like it's still a bit tight. But okay, it should be, should be working. So yeah, I work, I make a bit more. So yeah, take take your time. If it didn't, if you cut something wrong, you can also decide that you're gonna start again with another one. Um, 
and it, yes, that this session is recorded. If you don't manage to, to do it with me, you can still just watch today and come back to it um, another day and, or yeah, and take more time and pause in between moments. Okay. All right, so this one seems like it's fitting. Uh, I'm going to do the other one. I'm going to remove that one as I do the other one, and then I'll tape everything together and um, I'll explain you what you can do with the tape so you get, because you'll have textures coming from uh, the texture of, of the tape you're using. So maybe you want to think of the way you apply the, the tape so you get something that looks nice for you. Um, so the second shape I wanted to put is this circle, this cylinder that I'm going to put around here. So same as for the other cubic shape, I'm going to come and I'm going to trace. Um, I, I wouldn't recommend you to try and fit, I mean, you could, you could, you could definitely do that um, if you want to have the two shapes overlapping like, like so. Um, that would be harder. So uh, I'd say for this first time, maybe you can just have them separate, separated this way. And maybe when you when you get more um, more experimented, um, when you're a bit more confident with this, you can start doing more crazy shapes. I will also say that these packagings on the easiest um, and um, if you wanted to get to very complex shapes, um, using polystyrene is better because you can carve in it before and you can, um, yeah, you, you can reach more complex and elaborated shapes. But I didn't want to use polystyrene today because I thought most people would only have these packagings um, and not everyone has access to polystyrene. You need to get, yeah, it's a bit harder to find uh, nice ones. Okay. So you can trace the other shape. And um, same as before, uh, do not cut as big as the shape you just traced because that's not gonna work out. And especially because this is not a perfect cylinder and it goes, it's wider at the base, smaller at the top. So I'm gonna start very small and I'll go as big as I need to, but slowly. So again, with the knife, trying not to cut yourself, just to open a tiny window space um, in it. And yeah, you can go in. If you're cutting circles, um, this is this is hard for me as well. Um, it's not the easiest, but it's fine if your circle is not perfect. The tape will just uh, fill the holes. So. Okay. So first hole is way too small, so I can go bigger. But again, take your time. Um, no rush, no need to go so big that you can't go back afterwards. Right, so hopefully by now um, you all managed to at least cut one shape. Okay, I'm not done yet. Um, yeah, I hope I'm not too slow nor too fast uh, and that you're all managing to follow up with my instructions and that you all see well as well. Um, okay. 
that should be fine. Okay, so this, as you might not see, but it's not perfect at all. You have holes here, here as well. It's really not perfect, but this, that's not a problem because now we're going to use the tape and make it work. So um, we're going to get any tape you've got. So it's either that type of tape or you might have just regular brown uh, duct tape. Um, either work. Um, they should be leak proof uh, anyways. So you're going to place your, your shape, the shape you just, that you just cut. You're gonna place it so it's almost at the edge, at, at the edge, like, um, I don't know if it's the edge, but the, the edge of this part should line up with the face, the inner, the inner side of this. So you, you will try and push it until it reaches that. And without pulling out, so that's the tricky part. And we're now gonna get our tape. We're going to get the tape and we're going to first secure the, the shape inside so it doesn't move too much and then we'll apply the tape to, so it's leak proof. So I'm going to put, I'm putting one, um, I'm putting three, put more, I'm putting them this way some I'm going to put them um, perpendicularly to the edge of the shape so it gets a better grip and then we'll go all along the, the circle. So we attach it that way. Okay, so it should so now this is secured and we're gonna peel the the inside because right now if i leave it like this half of the plaster is going to go through so just in order to seal you're gonna grab a longer bit of tape and as I'm using a circle shape, circular shape right now, I'm gonna I'm gonna come in my tape and I'm gonna slice, not slice it, but cut it into smaller strips, stripes, stripes, stripes. Um, so this shape can adapt to a circle, circular shape. So this bit will be in my cylinder. Um, I'll show you just now. Um, just so that part goes in the cylindric part, part, and then here you just come and tape the, the strips I just cut. The main um, mold part. Um, so you do this, this. So this is looking very ugly, I know, but don't worry. It, We'll, we'll make it better. We'll, we'll put another layer of tape um, and it will give you nice uh, textures as well. When you, when you re, um, remove the mold, it will, it will give um, a relief to the cast. So it won't be a plain, very smooth and uh, neat cast. It will be, I think, I, I find it really nice. Um, Okay, so we're, we, we keep going with the first shape we have. Oh, I forgot to mention, if you're just doing um, shapes that are just square, you just put the tape on one side and apply it that way. I'm going to actually do it now, so you, you can have the example of both. So with this shape, I'm putting it... Oh, no, that's not the one. Yeah. Um, I'm putting it in. And I'm using putting the tape on here, and this is going to fall back. So this um, yeah, 
string and then I think taking them. So this part comes here and I take it and I make sure it's well well stuck. So we go we keep going with the other sides of our shapes. So we're doing the inside of the mold right now and to make sure absolutely no plaster goes through, we'll then complete the to seal the mold on the outside. Okay. Roman. Yeah. I've got a question for when you're ready. Yeah. Um, so somebody's asking um, if you had an object that you wanted to use as a mold but you didn't want to destroy, would that be possible or does the process always ruin the mold? Um, well, yeah, so um, I always destroy the mold, mold afterwards and I never, yeah, never take an object that I want to mold and cast. Because um, it's not possible to so keep it intact, is that right? It, it will be really hard to keep, yeah, keep things that way. And that's why I, I always use packagings or polystyrene things mm -hmm. because I didn't, I didn't have in mind a very specific shape. Or if I did, I would make it with these materials uh, directly. Um, but I've never. Um, I mean, I, I I don't use that technique of molding, making a very nice object, and then molding and mm -hmm. casting. Um, yeah. <laughs> Oops. It's so satisfying to see it come together and fit nicely in the holes. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's really it's harder with these than with polystyrene. Um, I wish, yeah, I knew more about what people have in their home. Maybe polystyrene is a thing because they do give really really nice uh, cast and and the texture you get from the different types of polystyrene are really great. Okay. So. Oh. Okay. Okay, so um, I'm almost done with one of the parts. I hope it's fine for you as well, that it's not complicated or Frustrating. I hope no one's frustrated by now and that everyone's having a bit of fun at least. Um, okay. So I'm almost done with the inside part of my mold. Um, so Um, yeah, if anyone has questions, do not hesitate. Um, I don't necessarily realize when it's too hard or too fast. So. Okay. okay. Yeah, you won't necessarily, um, one of the things that you might have noticed in my work and um, that I really appreciate is that I don't necessarily like very neat things and I like it when it looks a bit messy and um, I don't know what, uncanny. So I don't know if that would be a word that would fit my work, but um, I like it when it has a rough texture, a rough um, aesthetic. Um, and I think it goes as well with the fact that I like collecting things uh, in the street or from the trash because uh, I, I, I think there's an aesthetic value in this. So the, the result of this will not be a very clean and nice uh, polished plaster cast, but it will have definitely uh, a character and you could also come afterwards and uh, sound some parts, use a Dremel or any kind of tool and maybe pierce holes into it, or you can draw on top of it. 
it's really up to you what you do next. Um, you can paint it, spray paint it if you want one solid color, if you don't like the effect you get. So I'm gonna go on the other side of the, outside of the mold just to make sure it's very leak proof. So as we did on the inside, but it should be easier. You're gonna come and you're gonna add tape on all sides, making sure that every part you cut and reassembled is now sealed on both sides. So you just, it doesn't need to be perfect on that side because it's just the outside and, and you will just destroy the mold eventually. So it doesn't need to be that perfect, but still it needs to fill all the holes. And I promise once we're done with this, we're gonna jump on to the next part, which is much funnier, I think. That's my, yeah, that's the funny part because it's the part when you get a bit more creative and you, you pick pigments, colors. There are different ways of applying the thing. So you either, oh, you, you'll see, but it's, it's more exciting. Um, I've never used such a thin plastic. I hope it will work. Um, it should be working, but um, I usually use stronger one, so we'll see. Um, okay. So again, for round shapes, I advise you to do the same technique of um, making these strips so you can actually get it to fit a circular, circular um, shape. Roman, while you're working, I've, I've had another question in. Mm -hmm. um, so someone's wondering, um, do you do detailed sketches of your concepts before you start, or do you generally just start working with the materials and see where they take you? Um, so when I when I make these things, or um, when I made um, the, the Lost Dimension, so the bigger sculpture, um, I would never sketch the cast parts because I, I think I really work like a colorist or a painter when I do this. So I will just mix colors together and think which ones would go together well. And then I just apply the different touches of plaster. And because I'm working not reverse, but what I'm applying, I'm making layers of it. And I don't see what the first layer was when I'm doing the last ones. I will only see the result when I remove the cat, the, the mold. So it's a lot of uh, un, uh, randomness around mm. the process. I guess the material itself, you never quite know what consistency you're going to mix or what the, yeah. Yeah. Um, so that is, yeah, I think the concept comes later. So for if I get, if I keep the concept of uh, the lost dimension, um, the polystyrens I found um, just inspired me. So I played around a lot. But then from that, I, I drew and took two pictures of the first kind of ideas I had before I fetched it. Uh, I, um, no, I like kind of crystallized it into the sculpture. So I always have this back and forth between, uh, I, make, I make something, but it's temporary. Take a picture, we'll wait. I'll work on the more random part of making the cast. And then when I go back to it, I decide which, which what I think worked best. Yeah. But um, I work very differently when I work um, digitally. So I will work from existing elements, from sculptures I made or from objects I have around me. And so it won't be sketches, but I will have the base, the basis to, from which I Mm -hmm. uh, okay. I understand. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then I, if I make a video, I will make very, 
I, I'll, I'll have a storyboard, but uh, only I can understand it because it's very bad sketches. It's mostly, <laughs> maybe it has three words and a very raw thing that, uh, it could be a tree or it could be a wind turbine or it could be the Eiffel Tower. <laughs> only I can tell. Well, I guess that's, you're, you're the person that matters. <laughs> so, as long as you can understand it. Well, that's why I'm not really a designer, I think, because I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't give instructions to someone else. I think there would be a, a lot of misunderstanding. Okay, um, I'm going to turn my camera off again and leave you to get on with the next section. Um, once we're done with um, that part, so the, the outside should be leak proof now, what you can do is consider the inside. So right now mine looks like this, and um, I think I'm going to keep it that way, but you might want to have only one tap one type of texture all over, which I sometimes did like covering the whole mold with the tape. So I get a, you, uh, hit a homogeneous um, surface. So if you want that, then I'll, I'll show you on one part. Um, you're gonna take tape, uh, I, I think I didn't, uh, didn't take enough. Or maybe I did. Uh, and you're going to apply it very cautiously so it goes on the edges. Okay, let's do that way. So, yeah, um, just as if you were covering a whole room with tape or a whole yeah, box, uh, you, you want to put the tape as without any wrinkles. So, you're going to make sure you're applying it very. Um, with a lot of finesse or um, just very polished. And then you cut on the edge. And so the next strip, you're gonna put right next to the first one and you go on, on all over them, all over the mold. So that's the way you reach something very, um, yeah, that will have a very homogeneous texture all across the, the cast. Okay, so I'm, I won't do it today because that will take too much time and also I'm not in, that interested in this uh, homogeneity. Okay, so now you should have your mold ready. Uh, once you have that ready, um, I don't know if I should leave a few minutes or not minutes, but a minute or two for you to complete your mold. And I, uh, we're going to jump into the second part, which hopefully is also the funniest for you and for me. Um, and for this part, uh, I think it's better if you get a mask and you, you're not forced to wear them. Sometimes they're great. Um, and if you're wearing something that you care for, like some kind of precious top, don't hesitate to put on something that you can get a bit dirty just in case so i'll i'll stain this one for instance uh so yeah and again if you have any questions now is the moment to ask before i start the, the more um hands-on part of the workshop and more dirty part of the workshop um and so for that second part we're gonna get our ingredients or ingredients not materials so we've got the plaster filler here mine is a bit pinkish but sometimes it comes whiter and it will then affect the color at the end and i'm going to use a few of these pigments i have with me but you can also use as i mentioned in the description you can use spices and you can use paint or also use uh, acrylic paint All right, uh, so you've got this, a bucket in which you're gonna mix the plaster filler. Um, and yeah, um, oh yeah, and spoons if you need to, to grab your pigments and put them in your mixture. So the first thing you're gonna do is you're gonna put on your mask because this is very dusty. I hope you can hear me even with the mask. Um, this is very dusty and not really good for your lungs. And so you're gonna grab your bucket and start off by pouring. So 
you're going to need quite a bit to fill the whole um, the whole mold. So don't don't be scared to put quite some yeah quite some powder. I'm going to put half of it. And don't don't worry too much about the colors you're going to use. And if you think you're going to use many colors and you need to do small pots, we're going to start with one big, and then we can just split into different uh, smaller containers so you can mix different colors. So once you've got your powder ready, you're gonna make a tiny hole, or not tiny, but try and get the powder on the side so you've got some sort of a, of a volcano uh, hole. And you're gonna pour a bit of water, but do not overdo it with the water because this material is a paste. It's gonna be the, you're not gonna reach a very liquidy, um, texture you're going to reach something that's yeah like a paste so you can really work with it and it's really nice to apply because it's going to be almost like you're applying um like you're glazing your cake or something like that so just pour a bit of water start with um i'm going to try and show you so that's how much i put for now and the key is to to just try and get all the powder in the water because sometimes it will clog and you'll get these weird patchy um, bits and you don't want that to happen. So you're gonna mix and using your spatula, really kind of push the, um, the powder in the water. And if it, get, if it feels like there's definitely not enough water, then add just a little bit. But yeah, take your time. Um, I'll show you what consistency is best. Or, I mean, there's a range of consistency you could go for. It. You could go for different um, different consistency regarding, um, depending on what effects you're looking for as well. Um, so I'm just adding a tiny bit. I really don't want you don't want it to be over soaked because it's going to take ages to dry and it's going to separate as well. Like the, the water is going to go up. It's yeah, it's really different from um, the actual mold uh, uh, casting plaster. That's you that usually have the water first and you put uh, plaster um, in a very specific way and you need a very, very liquidy texture that will then dry quickly. This is the complete opposite. You're starting with the powder and you're you're adding little by little a bit of water. So. But you don't want, okay, I'm gonna try and wrap. You really don't want that kind of dry aspect to happen. So this is, I don't know if you can see much, but um, you, you still want to be able to have a smooth texture. Um, it might just be, you need very little water to add up. Okay. I'm getting close to the texture I want to show you. That's really nice. Make sure you, yeah, you don't have any packs of dried plaster. And the result should look somewhere near this. Okay, it's not. I hope you can see enough. But this is the type of texture you want to go for, or a bit more liquidy. Um, so that's really nice because it's it's a bit gooey, but it's still it can hold itself, and that's going to be really. It, it's going to give away a really nice. Um, yeah, it's really nice to work with. Okay, so once you're done with it, I'm going to isolate a tiny bit of it because I'm going to I'm going to apply this in touches. So I don't want the whole um, the whole cast to be the same color. So I'm going to start by taking off taking out this part in another bucket. Um, but you can do everything in one bucket as well. It's just the way you mix things um, that will change it. So I'm adding this and I'm going to start with paint. So um, there's one way of doing it. You just put paint, however much you need, and you'll adapt uh, depending on the color you want to reach. And so um, while you mix, I the way I mix is I don't go like a spoon. I oops, 
I just I grab it that way. I come back on the lip of the lid and then I keep doing this until it mixes. And the reason I do that is because it usually works better than trying to mix it as as if it was a spoon. And also I can get some nice um, kind of um, marble effects. I mean, not this time, but and this time I'm going for a block, a solid color with this pink I added, but you could get really nice. I'll show you with the pigments. It usually works best. Um, so yeah, you're mixing it, and when you're you like the color, you're rich. Or well, yeah, I'm so sorry, the colors look really dull on the screen. But once you like the color, you're just gonna come and you're gonna apply it on whichever part of the mold you want this to be. Right now, I can see that my plaster is not uh, liquid enough, so I'm gonna add more. So don't do not hesitate to mix more water if you feel like you're. Mixture is too dry um, and that you can't work with it properly. So I made it way more liquid, you know. Um, all you want to do is that it's getting smooth. Um, yeah, you just want a really smooth, um, homogeneous paste. Okay, so, um, so that's that was one way you're using the paint and you're and you're just adding it up in the mold. You can just use it also very raw if you like the color initially. So I'm going to put some. And I'm really random when I do it. Like I really don't look at, I mean, sometimes I think, oh, this color might be nice with this other color, but this time I just drip some. OK, so another um, thing I do a lot is that I'm going to show you in a minute. I get some of the color. Um, here, separate it in a different pot. And I want to have, I want to color the paste, but I also want to have pigments um, bits as I put it on my mold. So you have two options. You can directly um, come and um, powder some pigments on in your mold. So it means that you're going to still when you're going to pour the cast the plaster, it's going to come and stick on the pigment you just dropped. So I'm I'm doing I'm doing a bit of green and oops, a lot of green and um, Bordeaux. Uh, you can mix them up, but you can also do it. Uh, so I'm going to see what I just did now. But uh, so yeah, um, I just poured some pigments here and now. Um, Adding up the plaster. Okay. But what you can do, and I really like doing that because I have more control over what I'm choosing, is that I in the in the pig in the plaster I've selected to keep here, I add one, two, or three colors. So Let's do two for now. So I, I went for this orange, neon orange, and then we'll go for black, and maybe a bit of green. So again, I'm I'm a very not precise person, uh, and I I trust more what I see than uh, measurements. So I'll just start and like mix it up, but I might not mix it up completely, so I get a very oh yes okay. Um, so I get this kind of effect. I'm going to try and have you look at it. So it's very, it's not mixed at all. And if I like what's going on here, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to keep it that way. And I'm going to just come and um, drop it where I want it to be. So, so I keep exactly that color and the way colors were placed. I keep it and I just apply it on my mold. And I keep going, so I still have some here in my in my bucket, so I can just go on and add more green, for instance, if I want more green. So I go with the pigments that that remained, and it will change. The color will evolve, and it will get more and more mixed. And maybe by the end of it, I will just have one solid color that will be the mixture 
of the colors I used before. Uh, so I always start with the, the lightest color because obviously the more colors you add, the darker your, your paste is gonna get. So um, I've, got, I've got still some paste going on here. So um, I think I'm gonna do more of the paint part. Uh, of course, if you if you don't have like paint pigments, but you're using spices, it should be the same. It should be the same. It should be um, using turmeric. Is turmeric is a natural pigment, anyways? Uh, uh, I mean, not really, but it, it does dye or color things um, like a pigment does. Um, I mean, all the um, paprikas, all these red orangey powders, they're really great for these kind of things. Um, so yeah, um, I'm going on. I could decide that I like this kind of scattered effect with the paint and I'll apply it here. Um, so yeah, you, um, so I always start by doing all the edges of the mold because that's what we're gonna see in the end. And once I'm done with um, all across, then I usually make a bigger batch of the a bigger batch of the um, plaster that I keep raw because I don't want to I don't want to waste pigments or other materials. So I'll just I'll just yeah do the edges however you want. Play with colors. You can also I used to do that way more. You can just place objects or. Uh, bits of glass or marble, other things you can include in your in your shape and you seal them again with the plaster. And then when you're going to remove it from the mold, you'll get them stuck in, in your shape. So it will be yeah, a little bit interesting. Roman, um, I'm glad after... you sorry. Oh sorry. I was just gonna say I'm glad you answered that because that was a question that we just had in as oh, well. Nice. <laughs> Yes, it, it's really it's really up to you what you add in it. You can also prepare if you wanted this to have a hole instead of drilling afterwards. You can also place you can um, go halfway and then place a tube here and then keep going. So then you can just remove the tube if it's a soft tube. Go for something so, or a straw. You can put a straw, a big straw, and then you'll have a hole. So it's nice. You can put thread through it, and you can really experiment. With, from that point. And the, the last thing I wanted to show on that, and then I'll show you how it looks when you remove it, is that, uh, so I didn't do the whole thing, but if you wanted it to overflow and leak a bit like uh, some of my sculptures, what I usually have is that I don't have my molds um, even. So, um, so imagine I have put everywhere and I filled it up to here then what I'd do is I'd, um, I'd, I'd get the, I'm doing in layers. So I, I usually don't have, every, for instance, I could stop here and I could come back tomorrow and go on. So I wait until everything's dry and then I'll add on some parts that will then, I'll, I'll add on part that will just overflow from my mold. And that's how I get these more <laughs> uncontrolled um, bits. Uh, and this is very resistant. Um, in terms of details, it has details, but it's not details I made in, in the mold. It's just the material that behaves a certain way. And uh, as for after kind of treatment you can do on the surface, uh, on here I've, I've used uh, oil paint and then I scratched it, oil paint as well. And you can spray paint. Um, I believe you could varnish, uh, it will just absorb so maybe not varnish, but you could uh, you can definitely have a play with different um, paints and um, different other ways of yeah um, agreementing um, yeah the the shape. Uh, one thing I was thinking of. Um, um, no, I can't remember. Oh yeah. Um, because you're using um, dry pigment, uh, it might be that the sculpture remains always a bit staining. So um, even if it will stay on the sculpture and most of the pigment will never leave, if you grab the sculpture, uh, you might 
get stained because usually pigments are used uh, blended into different um, bending, uh, binding materials such as oil uh, like and um, Arabic gum and all these uh, binding that keep the pigment inside whereas here the plaster has some inside and that's when it's very smooth and blended in but all the pigment I put on the sides uh, when I remove the mold it will it will stain so um, if I do this I stain my finger a bit so I'm going to try and remove this so you can see a bit more of what I'm what I made last week um, so you have an idea of what you can expect from yours do you my think, example, oh, sorry do you think in the same way you can use hairspray to fix charcoal for instance do you think oh. you could fix it with you could fix the turmeric or the pigment with a with a hairspray yeah I think it would work I've never even tried it because I I never think of that but that's a really good <laughs> and yeah because that's, that's definitely a, a really good idea <laughs> yeah, yeah or just any, any spray varnish might work yeah exactly I think that's a really great uh note oh yes nice okay so we'll see also the different kind of roughness you can get so my yes nice so the mold I, I used last week great so um, uh, hopefully you can see with this camera but this is what the tape left and I read I'm really into these things I I'm, I'm looking for this kind of effect so um, I'm really happy with the result I get here um, here's what we've got um, here the tape was here um, the more um, the uh, Oh, the smoother the plastic, the smoother your surface will be. So when I cast in, um, I've got a few cast from just ice cream tubs and they are usually quite smooth um, because these plastics are very smooth. But then polystyrene is a bit rough. So it usually gets, um, yeah, it's a bit, it's a bit less it's a bit more granulous let's say and these aren't really nice um, I'm so sorry I only have this one to show you today but um, you get an idea of how it looks when finished also the way the way you're going to have it um, dry will impact um, will, will, will change the um, texture so um, I still haven't figured out why but uh, when it's really wet and it dries slowly I get these white lines the white outlines it might just be the, the water coming up or for some reason so I never control completely these and I also enjoy the fight I, I will never see the result before it's actually completely dry um, even though it dries quickly I would still say leave it a few days um, three, four days before you remove it. And the bigger the sculpture, the more time you should wait. Uh, because when it's not completely dry, there are more risks for it to break. So if you're doing something a bit less sturdy and a bit more delicate than this, uh, just be patient. And I hope you like the result you get uh, at the end. Because <laughs> mine is not really successful, but I hope yours will be nicer. <laughs> um, I think that's I think that's it uh, in terms of workshop and I hope you all enjoyed it and managed to get something out of it maybe not a sculpture yet but at least some good tips <laughs> Thanks, thanks, Roman. Um, if anybody has any questions at this point, we'll we'll go ahead and take them. Um, so far, just um, we've got a few people saying uh, thank you. It's very exciting, and they're looking forward to making their own. That's nice. I can't wait to see. I don't know if people will. Uh, I will encourage people to tag me on Instagram if they do something that would be really nice, actually, if they wanted to share or even send me a picture if they don't want to 
post anything, but I'd love to see the results. So um, if we don't have any other questions, I'll kind of go ahead and close the session. Um, before everybody leaves today, I just wanted to thank you all very much for, for joining us. And especially wanted to um, thank Kate for helping to organize this and to putting us in touch um, with Roman. And thank you so much, Roman, for sharing some of your process with us and your time with us. Um, I hope you all found the session fun and informative and hopefully you're all ready to do some casting with your learners if you haven't already been able to follow along today. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning of the session, the video will be available shortly for you to pass on to your learners or follow along in class um, if you weren't able to. And we're going to email you the link directly if you participated today, as soon as that's available. And as Roman said, if, if you'd like to get in touch with her directly, we're gonna post her um, Instagram account um, into the chat so you can get in touch with her via that link in just a moment here. Um, we'd also really love to hear your thoughts on this session and your ideas for future sessions. So if you have five minutes now while it's fresh in your minds, um, please give us your feedback and we're gonna pop the link to a feedback form into the, into the chat in just a moment here. And then finally, uh, we plan to bring you a lot more of these live workshops in the future. Um, and we also are currently producing a series of vlogs where we'll be speaking to creative practitioners and industry professionals who will be sharing their insights and ideas. So please sign up for our, our updates to be informed of upcoming events like these. And we'll put in the link in the chat now. And with that, let me just put the chat, put those links into the chat before you leave here. Joel, we've got three minutes left. Could I answer, ask one question on behalf of a participant? Oh, absolutely, yeah. Um, Roman, do you have any suggestions on coloring larger quantities of plaster? So if you're going to do something, I guess, really big, um, do you think there are any special considerations or could you just scale it up, basically just more pigment? Um, I think pigment would be very expensive, if, especially if you're using paint pigments. Um, so um, I'd say I used to, I used to love um, fruit colorings because they have a very extensive range of colors, and they, but not the powder ones, the liquid ones, and they're very strong. Um, yeah, I think that works. Uh, and I'd, I'd say yeah, maybe acry acrylic because it stays cheap and it colors quite well. Um, but yeah, food colorings are great and they're quite vivid as well. Um, cool. There was there was one more question about um, how delicate you can you can make these um, molds. So if you wanted to do something that was a little bit more. Um, precise and you know had maybe some more kind of um, delicate elements to it would they be likely to break when you tried to get the mold off or when you tried to pull it remove the mold um, or are they likely to or can you make them robust enough that they don't well if if the overall shape is big and it's just the detail on the surface like kind of a relief uh, I think that would work but um, I'm quite a clumsy person. So myself, I think I couldn't make anything that precise. And I would work uh, post-production, let's say. Um, I've got a Dremel. So if I want something quite delicate, I would work from something bigger and then refine it. That would be my way. Um, yeah. So, <laughs> but that's also because I'm very, um, I'm very likely to, to break it <laughs> in the process of removing the mold. Um, yeah. I see. <laughs> okay, thank you. I'm still just popping those links in the chat now. So um, if you'd like those, just hang around for just a moment. Apologies, every time I click on them to, to copy them, they just take me to the link. So I'm just doing that now. Roman, do you have any, um, are there any artists in particular that work in with a similar technique that you, I don't know, that you look at, that you draw an influence from? Um, or is it really just you just get your materials and um, it all just I don't know. you. I never really look at people and think, oh, technique-wise, technique that is interesting. It's more retrospectively. I, I make my things and then I'm thinking someone must have done that before. Mm. Uh, so I look up um, and I really, I think what could come 
as the closest reference I have would be Rachel what, what Red and her cat mm. of entire rooms because I'm really interested in architecture in general and the way we convey architectural feelings through sculptures. So I think her would be a very good inspiration, post inspiration, because I, I know I'm inspired now, but I wasn't when I was making the first sculptures. Yeah. And then there's this artist uh, that I think is really inspiring. And I first discovered his work. His work, he's called Kevin Bray, and he's working between um, very digital images and image, uh, very, yeah, post internet imagery and very sculptural objects. Mm -hmm. uh, he's a French artist is I think in his late 20s or 30s and I think he's really worth looking at. Um, yeah, so that these are, would be the ones that come in mind now. Uh, oh, and Tenant of Culture because she's, um, so their they're, um, collective, I mean Tenant of Culture is not her name but she uses a lot of things that she finds and then put together and she's also using plaster to put things together um so she would recreate weird weird shoes and she's very inspired by the fashion industry and i think yeah she's also someone i look up at, uh, all the time that's cool so if, if anybody wanted um to um find out more about those artists um joel's put put your Instagram handle in the chat now so people can get in touch with you if they've got any further questions um, and just to check out your, your work. Cool thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks very much for joining us everybody and have a good afternoon and thank you again Kate and Roman. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.